Okay, so put in your final guesses. Maybe you didn't get to all of them. Just put in some guesses for the last few. I know there are a bunch on there. Um, we have these different things. I wrote it as x1 and x2, because uh, we're thinking of these as the x values in our regression. Um, if you, you might think of this as x and y, right? We're gonna draw a picture in the plane of what does x squared plus y squared equal one look like. You know, this x1 squared plus x2 squared, the x coordinate and the second coordinate, sometimes called the y coordinate. So this one is the one that I think everybody should get. x1 squared plus x2 squared equals one. This is one from elementary school. Uh, let's see if you got it. Let's view the counts. This one is a circle, so very good. Out of 13 people, nine people knew that this one is a circle. Okay, some people did not know it's a circle. Okay, but, but this one is great. Uh, let's draw a picture of it. Everybody's favorite graphing calculator, x squared plus y squared equals one. Oh, look at that, nice circle. Okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, circle, very nice. These other ones might be tricky. Let's see if people had a consensus. So one of them that you might have seen before is this absolute value. Absolute value of x1 plus absolute value of x2 equals one looks like a... Some people said square, some people said diamond, pretty split. Out of 13 people, we got a five and a four and some stragglers. What other ones are there? Let's, let's look at x1 to the power six plus x2 to the power six. This one looks like a... All right, in this one, some people said star, some people said rounded square. Again, pretty split. Nobody's above half, right? 13, we've got six people in the biggest one. The maximum of x1 and x2, the maximum of x2 and x1 and x2, this one is also very split. Look at this. I think we got everybody's quite split, except for the circle. What about this one? Ooh, okay. This one, star is the most popular at five out of 13. So, split vote. That means we should revote. And look, the timer is telling me it's time to revote. So let's do it again. Think about it. Draw a picture. Get a pen and paper. If you want, you can put it into decimals yourself and see what the answer is. But I want to see some consensus converging on one answer, even if it's the wrong answer. So let's repeat this one. Repeat. And start it again. So try again. Now you know the circle one for sure. I'll give you a few more minutes. Let's say three, three minutes. And feel free to chat with your neighbors about what you think it is. Which shapes are, shapes are these? Could you plug in some points and try to see what they're, what they're like?
Okay, 20 seconds left. Put in some guesses. Maybe you found the pattern. There is a pattern going from the topmost to the bottommost. There's a certain kind of order to these. They're in order. Okay. Give you a couple more seconds to get your final guesses in for people. I know there's a lot of them. You gotta type in. Okay, 14, 14, 15, 16. Great. Let's take a look at what people said. Reveal. So, to start with, let's see, is everybody awake? One person is asleep. Uh, circle is the right answer, like we said. Um, I think the easiest one to figure out, if you have no idea what's going on, the easiest one to figure out is this maximum one. What does the maximum one look like? And here, nine people said square. Let's look in Desmos. Let's look in Desmos. So I'm doing the maximum of absolute value of x, comma, absolute value of y. That's what it is. Oh no, Desmos is mad at me. What does it not like? Try adding an equal sign. I got an equals one. Okay, thank you. Very good. <laughs> See, Desmos also told me. So there you go, it's a square. So if you said square, you are right. Why is it a square? Well, if the maximum equals one, let's do a little pen and paper over here. If the maximum equals one, right? So the maximum of x1 and x2 is equal to one, well then, either x1 equals one and x2 is less than one, or x2 is one and x1 is less than one, right? So if the maximum is equal to one, one of them, one of the two of them, one of them has to be equal to one. And when one of them is equal to one, this the absolute value equals one are these two lines. Like if you draw it, let me just draw it in, it does most, right? If you say the absolute value of x equals one, then you got those two vertical lines. And if you say the absolute value of y equals one, you get those two horizontal lines. And we're taking the pieces of those horizontal lines where the other coordinate is small. The other coordinate is less than one. So that's why that one works. OK, let's look at the other ones. Let's look at the other ones. Let's start with, this is another one that is quite well known, the absolute value of x1 plus x2. This one looks like a, OK, so some people said square, some people said diamond. Square was this one. So what does the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y equals 1 look like? It's a diamond. It's a diamond like that. Okay, so if you said diamond, good job. And so now maybe you can see the pattern. The diamond was a power of one. The circle, the red thing, is a power of two. And the square is a power, is a maximum. So they're kind of getting more and more pushed out. So in fact, if we do x, let's do absolute value of x to the power p plus the absolute value of y to the power p equals one. And let's add a slider for p. You can see when p equals 1, it's the diamond. Let's start at 0 and end at 100. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe we'll end at 10. OK. So when, when p equals 1, it's exactly the diamond. And as you move up, you move out. So when p is going from 1 to 2, then it becomes a circle. And then if you keep going, like if you go all the way up to 6, that was one of the questions. x to the 6 plus y to the 6 equals 1 is that purple curve is a rounded rectangle. That was one of the answers as well. Rounded rectangle. Yeah, rounded square. Uh, very good. So lots of people got that. On the other side, so we've done all of them except for the first one, the square root is to the power of half. So if you take it to the power of half, then you're going the other way. You're kind of shrinking in even more, and then it looks like that. OK, 0.54. Let's do 0.5. That is to the power of 0.5. That is what I called. A star. OK, so lots of people got it right, uh, just over half. So this is the pattern. As you increase the power, you go from very skinny things, you push out, and eventually you go through a circle at p equals 2, and then you go all the way out eventually. If you go, or go, to, the, go to the power infinity, if you take it to the power sort of infinity, it will eventually look like that maximum. right? The bigger you make the power, the more it cares about the maximum value. right? Because you have x to the power 100, if x is 0 0.9 to the power of 100, it'll be very close to 0. So the only thing that will matter when you take something to the power of 100 is whichever one is bigger. Whichever one is smaller will barely count, right? That one will be much smaller. Um, and that's why it's starting to look like this maximum. OK, so great. 
great work for people who got it got it right. Let's reveal the answer. So star, diamond, circle, uh, rounded square, and square. Okay. So some people I think had it in the reverse order, right? They put star at the bottom and they put a, a square over here, or, or maybe reverse. I don't know. Uh, but that those are the right answers. Um, okay. Any questions or comments about this thing? This might be one you've seen before. What are these things? Why are we talking about? Why did I make this the question? These things are different norms. These are different norms. And this is called the LP norm. So this is the LP norm on vectors, in this case, in R2. And the norm says, if you want to know some vector x1, x2, how big is the vector, you measure it with the LP norm. The definition is, how big is this vector, is you do x1 to the power p plus x2 to the power p, and then you take the 1 over, you take it to the power 1 over p, that's the pth root. And the most famous of these is the L2 norm. That's just regular Pythagoras. So the, the, the 2 norm, the L2 norm, is x1 squared plus x2 squared square root. That's just regular distance in regular land. But the other ones also kind of make sense. So if you do uh, the 1 norm, x1, x2, and you do the 1 norm, the L1 norm, then you get the absolute value of x1 plus the absolute value of x2. This is sometimes called the Manhattan distance. The Manhattan distance. And why is it called the Manhattan distance? It's because, let me show you on the, who's been to Manhattan before. All right, Manhattan is this, is this amazing city. This is where I, I did my PhD in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan for, for six years of my life. Let me show you a map, Manhattan map. Why is it called the Manhattan distance? So here it's, this, it's the city. Let's click on it and zoom in. This is New York City. If you zoom in, let's zoom in. Okay, this is near Central Park. You see it's all made of Grids. The whole city is made of grids. So if you are in the city, can I draw on this map? Where did my pen go? That would help. Let's, uh, let's do a quick little copy, a little piece of Manhattan into my, into my thing so I can draw all over it. Okay, so here is a piece of Manhattan. And let's pretend you start over here at uh, 75th and 1st. You're here, and the question is, how far do you have to walk to get over here to uh, 78th and 2nd Avenue? So everything is labeled, it's, it's quite nice. So you, you start here, and you wanna end here. How far do you have to go? Well, if you're a regular person, you measure distance the regular way, you say, okay, well, it's just this distance. You measure how long that purple line is. That's the distance, right? That's how regular people measure distance. That's how Pythagoras measures distance. But in Manhattan, you cannot walk through the buildings. There's buildings blocking you. So how far do you have to go? You have to go all the way up here, and then you have to go that way. So how far do you have to walk in total? Well, you have to walk the difference, the x1 value. That's how far up you have to go. And then how far over do you have to go? That's the x2 value. And you add those together. So this distance is called the Manhattan distance. It's how far you have to walk if you're only allowed to go up and over, right? So in the ordinary distance, you're allowed to go diagonally. You can go in any direction, which is why you get a nice circle. But in the Manhattan distance, you can only walk either up and over. And that is why it looks like a diamond, that green diamond, instead of a circle, right? Because if you can only walk up and over, these points, even though they look like they're close, these points in the middle here, you say, oh, that's closer to the origin. But it's not actually closer to the origin if you can only go up and over, right? You go up and then you go over. Walking to here is the same distance as walking all the way to the top. It's the same amount of walking if you're only allowed to go up and over. Whereas if you're allowed to go diagonally, you can go farther. People who play uh, video games also know about this, right? If, if you're playing a game that's on a grid and you can only go up and right, um, then you know places that are diagonal to you are a little further than you would expect in regular play. Okay. And why is this a big deal? It's because you can use any of these norms you want in your algorithms. So we said. Last time we said ridge regression was L2 regularization. We added on this term. We added on this term. This was for ridge regression. We added it on. And I told you last time, ridge regression is a silly name. I have no idea what ridge means. You should really think of it as L2 regularization. Regu regularization. 
you're adding on the L2 norm, so of the parameters beta 1 and beta 2, however big the L2 norm of that vector is, that gets added on as a penalty, and that had all the nice properties we had. This, I definitely spelt, spelt regularization wrong. That's red girl orization. There's something else. But okay, you, you guys get the idea. Today we're doing the lasso. Why is it called the lasso? Uh, again, I don't know. The, the people uh, in the video are some of the inventors of the lasso. So you could ask them. I think they had some, some stupid reason why, why it's lasso. I don't know. It lassos in the... Okay, I don't, I don't want to get into it. Um, but it really is L1 regularization. Regular? I'll try again with the spelling. Okay, good, good skill. Uh, and so we're just gonna change the formula to have these absolute values, and we're gonna see what changes. And you saw in the videos, it makes a big difference. You get a completely different uh, uh, formula. And so I'm gonna show you visually why it's different. And it really, this picture, if you know this picture, the L2 is the circle, the L1 is the diamond. You could, you could do a different one. You could, should we give it a funny name? We'll call it the square re regression. Uh, well, you could do the maximum. That would be up to you. So we're only going to focus on the green and the red today. So let's turn off this purple one and this blue one. And uh, so this is the set where x1 squared plus x2 squared equals 1. And we want to add that on as a penalty term. And so let me show you what that penalty term looks like. I'm going to go back to this thing that we ended the class with last time. So here, the x and the y plane represent beta 1 and beta 2, right? And that little dot, that little dot over here on the bottom, that is the true value of beta 1, beta 2 that we're trying to find. And remember, we have this surface, which is like, what is the mean squared error of different estimates, right? And this is a pretty highly correlated situation where if you get beta 1, beta 2 exactly right, then you have the minimum mean squared error. It happens right above that green dot. That's the minimum mean squared error. But if you are off by a little bit, as long as you get the sum right, then you don't get it super wrong. And this is the multicollinearity problem, right? Which is that this, you have this long valley, and all of the points along the valley, all of the points along this red x plus y equals constant line, they all have pretty good, pretty good values. So when you're estimating, it's hard to know the exact value of x and y because all of these values sort of have equally good mean squared error. Uh, maybe if I zoom out a bit so we can see a little bit more. So there's the bowl. So this, this x and y are the betas, right? That represents the two beta values, beta 1 and beta 2, that we're trying to estimate. And that green surface is how much loss you have. What is the mean squared error for every different value of beta? Uh, okay, I'm going to start doing some fancy stuff with this. So is the, is the picture clear? Okay, so what we did last time is we were doing ridge regression. And ridge regression is adding on that L2 penalty. So let me show you what the L2 penalty looks like. I called it capital L, and I set the power to 2. So we were adding on this purple thing. So we said, if you add it, if, if beta, and beta 1 and beta 2 are 0, you get no penalty, right? We add on beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared, you get no penalty. If beta 1 plus beta 2 squared equals 1, that is along this circle, along that red circle, then we would add on 1. Right? And so the bigger your beta 1 and the beta 2 value are, the more error you were adding on. We're ta basically taking this purple surface and saying this is an extra penalty that you have to pay. So the green is our real thing, the real data, and the purple is a regularization term that we're adding on. And the purple one, I want you to notice, is perfectly round, is a perfect circle. The green one is this weird valley thing that has to do with the data. It's got this multicollinearity problem in it. Uh, but the purple is the regularization term. We are the people who added that on, and we made that perfectly circular because we did uh, exactly x1 squared plus x2 squared. So, so in words, we had these two surfaces, two surfaces. And so in green, we have the mean squared error, and that depends on beta 1 and beta 2. Okay, really, it like, depends on what we're trying to estimate. So for every given estimate, it, we have a value, but then there's this purple surface, which is plus uh, beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared. Then we're adding that on. And so the purple surface is this perfect cone. I'll draw it over here. Perfect cone. Uh, it, it's technically, it's like a quadratic surface. And this green one, this is the valley. This has the valley. And this one can suffer from multicollinearity due to multi. So if, if there's a high correlation, 
this will be some narrow thing in that direction. Okay, so those are the two surfaces we have in the picture. And so those are them individually. What happens when we add them together? Uh, that is this function. Let me actually, uh, so we'll stop moving around. Uh, so I can slide, right now the alpha value is zero. I can slide the alpha value and we'll see how it changes. So the green surface will still be the green surface. Uh, you know what, let me, let me make a new one so that the colors stay constant. So let's delete all this. Let's keep the green one as green forever. So we can compare with how does it move? Let's make this one blue. And let's see, as we change alpha, how does it, the blue change away from the green? So as you change alpha, as you increase alpha, you get a new surface, and the new surface is more and more round. So as you increase alpha, that is the coefficient that we're gonna add on here. Let's make that in blue right here. Plus alpha times this, plus alpha times this. As you increase the value of alpha, you're adding on more and more of this perfect circle to it. And that is why it's getting smoothed out. So you increase alpha, as if you add a really big value of alpha, basically you have a lot of that purple cone, right? That purple cone matters a lot. We're adding a big multiple of that purple cone to the narrow green value and that smooths it out and makes it nice, right? We're deleting the collinearity problem of being all in one line is sort of going away the more we add these things on. And we're less subject to noise. So when you, when you randomly sample, you move this green surface around a little bit and if you jiggle it just a little bit, you'll get bad answers, right? Um, but that blue surface is more robust. It doesn't jiggle as much, and that's why we like it. So this is a picture version of all the things we talked about last time. Hopefully you guys are getting this green, which is the original thing, the purple, which is our regularization, and the blue, which is the sum of both together. So the total is the blue. Yeah, so the, and that was, that was ridge, the ridge loss. The ridge loss as a function of beta one hat and beta two hat, that's the blue, the blue curve, which is the sum of the two things with a coefficient of alpha that controls how big this thing is. Okay, so did, did that picture make sense? Um, with, does that gel with what, what you guys were thinking last time? Any questions or comments about this? So today we're gonna do the lasso. It's gonna be even more crazy, but hopefully we can modify the picture and make it work. Okay, so let's see what would happen if instead of, uh, let's, okay, let's turn off this blue curve. Where, where's the blue curve? Let's turn off the blue curve. So we have the green and the purple, just like before. The green is really the data, that'll still be there. But the purple, that is up to us. We chose to add on the sum of x1 squared plus x2 squared. We could choose instead to do a different power, right? What would happen if we do the lasso? That would be the power one. So let's see, how does this purple cone change as I go to one? And you should be able to know the answer already because we did it as our own problem. So. What is going to happen when I change the power from 2 to 1? Let's see what happens. It becomes this square looking thing. So there you go. It becomes like a little pyramid that gets added on. And if you look at the pyramid from the top, it's exactly the shape we had before of the diamond. Right? So the purple penalty term, instead of being a cone, is this diamond. And it comes from the fact that x absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y equals one is the Manhattan distance is that diamond, right? And that's why we're adding on a diamond instead of adding on a cone. Okay, you can say, who cares? Well, I don't know, it's basically the same, right? Adding on a diamond or adding on a cone. But there is a really big difference, which is that in the diamond, you can see something special is happening on the axes, right? On the, on the x and y axis, something special is happening. Those are sort of corners of the pyramid. And those corners will matter. Okay, and you can see what happens if I add it on. So let's turn off, let's, let's add, like we did before, let's make the, the blue curve, which will be the sum of the green plus alpha times the purple. And let's see what happens. So first I'll make alpha zero. When alpha is zero, we should just get exactly the green curve. And let me turn off the purple so we can see what's going on. But as I increase alpha, you'll see something funny happen. So here we go, I'm increasing alpha, and you get to this curve, which again, it's smoothing it out, but if you look carefully uh, as, as to what's going on, you should be able to see, okay, it's a little hard to see. Let me uh, try to make it easier to see. Maybe I gotta zoom in a bit. Ah, okay, if you zoom in, you can see it. Do you see in this blue curve, you can see these little folds on the axis, right? Those little folds. And so what's happening is because the pyramid we added on, that purple pyramid we added on to the green curve, 
because it has these corners, the blue thing now also has these corners. So where is the minimum of the blue going to be? The minimum will often be somewhere on the axes. So the minimum happens along the axes. And when the minimum happens along the axis, like if you look right here, you can see that's the minimum is happening exactly when x equals zero. It's on the y-axis perfectly. It's not near y equals zero or something. It's exactly on y equals zero because there's a corner exactly on y equals zero. And having a solution with y equals zero, that is exactly saying one of the coefficients was zero. And this is the whole point of the lasso, is that by adding on something with corners exactly on places where we care about, we can make it so that the estimates we get are maximized exactly when one of the coefficients is zero. So the, for the, the uh, lasso, so the lasso loss of beta hat one, beta hat two, it's again, it's the same kind of sum as before. So uh, it's the MSE of beta hat one and beta hat two uh, plus alpha, but this time it's something else. It's the absolute value of beta hat one plus beta hat two. And this part, this has corners. This is the pyramid. This is the pyramid. Pyramid. And the, the corners of this term translate into corners. This causes corners to appear over here. Has corners. Has corners. I'm going to call them corners. At x equals 0. Or beta hat 1 equals 0. Or beta hat 2 equals 0. And those corners cause it so that when you optimize this, you find the lowest possible loss, it will be at a point where one of the coefficients is exactly zero. And that, when one of the coefficients is exactly zero, that's saying, I don't care about that variable at all, right? I multiply that variable. In my method, I multiply the, the, the coefficient of zero times the thing because it's perfectly zero. It's like deleting the variable. So this is doing a combination of two things we've talked about earlier in the course. We said variable selection was a thing. We do that on project one. You explicitly said, I'm going to ignore some of these variables. We said regularization, ridge regression. That was something we did last class. That's this regularization idea. And lasso is like combining them. So it's doing regularization, and it's automatically turning off some of the coefficients by finding solutions on these corners where it's already 0. So that's like the big idea, and this is like the picture. I'm going to show you in a little more detail exactly why it happens and where do you things have to be. Uh, but any questions or comments about that? So hopefully you can see the corners here. I feel like I, oh yeah, there you can see it. If you, if you kind of go like that, you can see the corners appearing, hopefully, on this uh, surface. Um, so hopefully you guys can see that shadow of the corner. I'm not sure how clear it is. Um, maybe, you know what, let's try it. If I think if I move, let me move A to 0 0.1, then I think it's even more clear if I do that. Let me see if I can make it more clear. So yeah, you can see the minimum is occurring along this little kinked edge over here, which is caused by the corner. Um, I'm not sure how clear it is. <laughs> Hopefully uh, it's making sense. We're going to see it a different way as well. So this is the picture proof. We're going to do a little more detail. Any questions or comments about that? OK, so let's, let's, let me show you how this works a little bit in more detail. This is the picture. And what I did is I repeated all of the stuff that I did in the graphing calculator in Desmos. I did it in Python. And the nice thing about doing it in Python, so it's a repeat of everything we did, but in Python. And the nice thing is, in Python, uh, you can get the exact values. right? You can get the exact values in your group them. So this was the original loss function, which is this long, spread out thing. In Python, I drew the constant value contours. So this value is over here. This is the smallest value. This is near 0. And then as you go out, you get higher and higher values. So this picture is showing the same thing as that bowl going up, but it's shown in a different way in two dimensions. And the idea that as you add on, right, as you add on uh, more regularization, you get a rounder thing. Th those are these plots. So here is the original thing. And then as you add on, this is with alpha equals 0 0.1. And then the next one is alpha equals 1. And then the next one after that is alpha equals 10. So can I scroll down a little further? Oh, okay, I lied. Uh, this is alpha equals 10. And the one before that was alpha equals 1. Where, where did they go? Okay, so this is alpha equals 10. This is alpha equals... This is alpha equals 10. Why won't it show me what I want to see? Why? Why? Okay. 
Okay, there we go. So this is the original thing. This is alpha equals 0 0.1, alpha equals 1, and then that's alpha equals 10 down here. So 1, 10. And you can see it's getting rounder and rounder, right? It's a nice round bowl at the back. So this is the exact same thing we saw before. But the nice thing is I can ask Python, please calculate the bottom of the bowl. And that is the ridge regression thing. So if we just want to visualize these bowls, they go from being very long to being very round. We can visualize where is the bottom. And that is this plot over here. That is this plot. The optimal beta and how it's changing as you change the alpha value. So when alpha equals zero, that's all the way over here, you start at the true value. And then as you increase alpha, you shrink in towards zero. So the, the sort of original point was two, three. That's the optimal value. And then as you increase alpha, as you do the ridge regression, you get moved towards zero. This is another picture. This is another picture of what we saw last class of this kind of plot, right? Of the coefficients versus the regularization parameter. They start out at two and three and they shrink towards zero. And this is another way of representing it in the beta plane, right? So looking at it as a function of beta one and beta two, as you change the coefficient, you start here and then you get sucked in towards zero. All right, why am I showing you this picture? This picture, if you draw circles on this picture, you will start to see how things work. And in the videos, they called this the Lagrange multiplier method, which is a very fancy name for a very simple idea. So we're gonna go understand what this has to do with circles. And then we're gonna see how this uh, changing from ridge to the lasso leads to the diamond shape being really important. And why the diamond shape had these corners really make it um, turn off some of the variables. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this warm up question. We're, gonna, we're looking at this curve, and there's a question about this curve. So it starts at 2, 3, and then it gets, goes all the way to 0. And the question is, the optimal beta, let's think of it as a function. So it's this curve. It starts at 2, 3, and then it goes down to 0. And here's the question. Given a circle of radius c, so you draw a circle over top of this. You, you, you take this thing, and you draw a big circle somewhere here. And the question is, how many times can the circle intersect that curve? So. That's the question. How many times can the circle intersect the curve? And remember, the curve is, so you got beta hat, beta hat of alpha is the curve. So beta hat of alpha is the optimal, the minimum of the mean squared error loss plus alpha times beta hat 1 squared plus beta hat 2 squared, which is the L2 norm of beta hat squared. So beta hat of alpha is minimizing this. It depends on alpha because this alpha term is over here. And as you change alpha, you have this whole curve. And the question is, how many times can this curve intersect? Can intersect. So how, how can it intersect beta hat squared of L2 equals C? So you draw some circle. And to give a cartoon version, Right, we have beta hat one and beta hat two, and the curve looked something like this. It started up here at alpha equals zero, and then it did some funny thing like this. Where it went zoop, 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 and this was alpha equals uh, 10,000, or something like that, is very close to the origin. And as alpha goes to infinity, you get shrunken towards zero. We're asking how many times do you intersect this kind of curve? So if you draw a circle, that's beta hat squared of L2 equals, say, 2. How many times do the, does the curve intersect? And in this particular case, you can see it intersected one time. But from the formula, you should be able to also see, in general, how many times can it intersect? Could it intersect multiple times? Could it intersect zero times? That's the question. And if you look at if you stare at the formula, and you think about it, this, this term over here is related to this term, and that should be the connection you need. Okay. So I've given some hints. Let me give two minute timer. Please feel free to talk to your neighbors if you want about what, what's going on here. And we'll reconvene at the end of this vote. And I want you to select all the values that are possible. So don't just select the one value.
Okay, there's like 20 seconds left. I have like 10 votes. Does anybody need more time to think about it? Only one person, okay. Let's, let's uh, look at the answers and then we'll have a discussion. Maybe we'll do a revo. Okay, let's take a look. So let's reveal the counts. All right, so remember, it's select more than one. Select all the ones that are possible. Uh, only seven people picked zero intersections are possible. And zero intersections actually is possible, but for a silly reason, which is that if you just make the radius C too big, then you won't have any intersection. So if you just pick a really big radius, if you just pick C some huge number like this, so if this is C, this is the B, B1 squared plus beta 2 squared is 100 is some C. If C is too big, then you just don't have any intersections, right? And so for what values of C will you have some intersections? Well, when alpha equals 0, you start there. You definitely get shrunk in towards 0. So the biggest possible C that will have at least one intersection, the biggest possible C, is exactly the starting value. Biggest possible C uh, with at least one, at least one, is whatever you started at, that's the least square solution. So when, when alpha equals zero, that's exactly ordinary least squares, no regularization. And whatever, however far that is, whatever this distance is, that is the perfect circle that gets the one intersection, right? This, this distance, that circle will get one intersection. If you shrink it in, you'll get at least one intersection. And if you make it bigger, you get zero intersections. All right, so that, that's like a silly one. This is zero thing. 13 people realize one intersection is possible. Uh, some people, about half the people, think two or three are possible. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, could it be, could it be that it looks like this? Where it goes in and then out and then in like that. Could that happen? Because if that happened, then you would have two intersections on this circle, right? Like this, right? This would have two intersections. Oh, I guess it has three. Okay, this one has three. So, could this happen? Could this happen? Okay, so in this picture, there's three. You can try to think of an alternate picture where there's two. Uh, I'll let you guys re -vote. So we had about half the people. And remember, if you, if you choose, a, like, choose all the ones that are correct. So if you think one is possible and two are possible, if they're both possible, you should select both of them. It should let you select more than one. And in fact, yeah, definitely is working because 20 people answered, but the sum is to more than 20. So let's revote, and you're you're kind of deciding. Do you think this kind of picture is possible or not? Okay, uh, let's do another another vote. Uh, not not that one. I want this one. Okay. Okay. So it's open again. Take another few minutes. Uh, you know zero is possible now. You know one is possible. Tell me about two or three. Do you think it's possible or not?
Okay, I guess almost everybody has voted. There's a few seconds left. Maybe I'll stop it early. Uh, if you haven't voted yet, vote. Uh, I'm gonna stop it right now. All right, we're up to 20 again. Let's see, what did people say this time? Okay, so now people know zero and one are possible. That's what we said. And the class, as usual, you guys are make the most exciting votes. Out of 20 people, 10 people think two intersections are possible. And I guess that means 10 people didn't click on two intersections are possible. So it's exactly split. Is two possible or not? Okay, exactly split. Let me show you what would happen if there was two. Let's, let's draw this thing. You, so you're here, you start here, you're gonna hit the circle twice, and you wanna end here. So you're gonna start here, you want to end here, and you wanna hit the circle twice. So draw a curve that starts at the start, ends at the end, and touches the circle exactly twice. Let's see, can we do it? I go here, okay, first touch, and then second touch, and now you're like banished from the circle. You're not allowed to touch again. So you definitely can't do two. Two is right out, just because you have to start outside, you end inside, and every time you cross, you switch. So by continuity, and you can't like teleport from here to here, uh, you cannot have an even number of touches. Okay, so two is definitely not gonna happen. But now, could it be three? So two, two, two touches, no, just by geometry. That's a fun fact. Um, but three touches. Three, three? So three would look like that. And that is sort of like the picture I drew before. And for three, eight people said yes, 12 people said no. Uh, so there's a slight majority on no. Does anyone want to tell me what they thought of why it should be no? Why, why can't you have this picture? of starting here and ending here. So there are curves that do that. But remember, our curve is not just any curve. We're talking about this curve, the argmin of this thing, right? The minimum value of the mean squared error plus some constant. Uh, and we're trying to argue this can't happen. Anyone have an idea? So let's look at the formula. Let's look at the formula and what would happen at these three points. So at these three points, we know we're at the minimum of what? The mean squared error plus the thing. So these points, these points represent uh, the mean squared error. So the value of the mean squared error of beta hat one, beta hat two, and then they have three different alpha values, right? Along this curve are all different alpha values. So if we have three intersections, we have like alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, okay? And one of them is the minimum of the mean squared error plus alpha one times the norm, right? The norm squared. But look, the norm squared, this is the, this is the whole secret, right? The norm squared that appears in the formula, the thing we're minimizing in ridge regression, that norm squared, when you're on the circle, if beta hat one, beta hat two is on the circle, that is exactly C. I've dropped my pen. Right, if you're on the circle, that norm is C. So instead of writing this norm, I can just write C. So this is C, okay? So the mean squared error plus alpha one, this one, so this one minimizes, minimizes this. Minimizes that. Uh, the other one is minimizing the same thing, but with a different thing. Beta hat one, beta hat two, uh, plus, and then you have alpha two times C. Same thing is that on the circle, that penalty term is constant. Everywhere on that circle, it's the same penalty term. This is the, the whole point. And this is the mean squared error of beta hat one, beta hat two, plus alpha three times C, okay? And this, if you look at this, you see like, if alpha three is the biggest one, like alpha three is the closest to the origin, there's some kind of contradiction here, right? We're trying to minimize this function, and here you gave me a bigger penalty. You said a bigger penalty, alpha three. But it's still, like, like on the circle, why would you go here when you could have just gone here? Like, if this one is less, we're just comparing the mean squared errors, right? These terms are all the same C, and so when, you, when you're saying find the minimum, you're just finding the minimum of the mean squared error. How could there be three minimums of the mean squared error? It doesn't make any sense. There can only be one. So the correct answer is you can only intersect either one or zero times. 
So if you said one is possible and stopped at one, you got it right. And the reason is the only thing we're doing, because the penalty term is always constant c, we're just finding the minimum on the circle. So this is the fact. The theorem, if you want to be fancy, it's a theorem. But I'm going to call it a fact. Fact. So uh, for c less than the original, the, the, the stupid value where there's no intersections, so as long as c is less than what you started at, if you're making a smaller circle, there is exactly one intersection. And that intersection happens at the minimum on the circle. There is exactly one intersection. Exactly one intersection. And it happens at, so if you do beta hat of alpha, the formula is the minimum of the mean squared error of beta hat plus alpha times this norm. But if you're on the circle, it's the argument, it's the value where this is minimized. But if you're on the circle, you're just minimizing the mean squared error over the circle. And it happens at, so this is the argument anywhere. And if you're on the circle, it happens on the minimum of the circle of radius c. So you look only on the circle, and you find where on the circle does it have the smallest error. And then you're done. And that's because this penalty term is constant. Everywhere on the circle has the same penalty term. So if you're saying, please find where on the, please find the minimum of this plus this, well, this thing is a constant. So where is the minimum of this plus a constant? It's exactly just wherever the minimum is. And what this means is when we're doing these pictures, we can think of, not in terms of alpha, but we can think of where on the circle C. So this is the change in perspective. This is orig this original curve we had, which looks like this, beta hat of alpha, and we drew this curve, and it goes like this. It starts with alpha equals zero over here, and it ends at alpha equals infinity over here. We could equally well think of the same curve, think of it not as beta hat of alpha, but we could think of it as beta hat as a function of C. Okay, and here is C is the original value, whatever we started at. And here is C equals zero. And every single point in between, this could be C equals one, would be on the circle of radius one. So every value of C in between has one value. And so we can think of the curve not depending on alpha, but thinking of the radius C. And this is what they had in those videos. They had some plots where they switched from thinking of it as a function of alpha to they had it on the interval zero, one. And that was exactly thinking of it as a function of c. And the point is, when you think of it as a function of c, what you're doing is you're drawing this circle. For, for example, for c equals 1, you draw a circle of radius 1. And you say, where on the circle do we minimize the mean squared error? And the mean squared error, remember, is that funny looking uh, value curve. So let me, let me go to uh, uh, this thing. Let me copy the original thing. So here's the mean squared error surface. Let's copy and paste this in. And let's make this nice and big. It'll let me, okay. Okay, so, he's, so the origin is here, zero, zero. And what we're doing is we're drawing circles and we're trying to find where on the circle is the mean squared error minimized. So for example, if I draw a circle of that radius, that's kind of a bad circle, let's try one more time. Circle like that, and we zoom in a bit. So where on this circle is the mean squared error minimized? It's exactly where the circle is tangent to these contours. That's the Lagrange multiplier theorem. It just says that when you're minimizing over some, some surface, you just find out where the circle is tangent, where it touches, it just barely touches a contour line, and that is the optimal spot. So this will be beta hat of c. For some, the value of c equals 1, it'll be just at that point. And as you make it bigger or larger, you will touch these contour lines. So I imagine, you gotta imagine there's more contour lines like this and like this. And for different values of C, you get different circles and you get these different solutions. And as you shrink in C, you're moving, you're making up this curve that we had before. Um, so hopefully this picture makes sense. And the whole point, the whole thing I want you to see is how it is related to the circle, right? If you know the shape of the circle, you can figure out just by looking at the picture, kind of like roughly what it's doing. And it matches all the things we did before. So it's this idea of shrinking in towards zero. It's this idea of smoothing things out. It gets less and it depends less and less on what's going on at the center, right? At the center, it's very smooshed out. And as you get further away, it's more chilled out 
and regularized. Why are we doing all this? Because we want to do it for the lasso. And for the lasso, every single thing we talked about still works. And the only thing that is different is instead of a circle, you draw a diamond. That's the only thing that's different. So let's draw the diamond on the exact same way. And the diamond, again, you have different diamonds. So let me draw a couple more contour lines here. So there's some contour lines like this. And the absolute minimum is there somewhere. And now you're going to draw, starting at 0, 0, you're going to draw these little diamonds that look like this. So here is the diamond of radius 1. And here is the diamond of radius 2. OK? And here is the diamond of radius 1.5. Uh, let's draw it in this green color in between. And the point is, where on the diamond are things minimized, it will sometimes happen that it touches the corners exactly. So the, where the diamond is tangent to these contour lines will be exactly on the corners, because the corners sort of stick out more. So it's sort of like moving around this diamond, and the diamond happens to bump into where the entry is. So for example, on this green one, the minimum is right here, and the minimum is right on the diamond. So that would mean, when we do our regression, when we add down this term, by maximizing over this diamond, we find a solution where one of the coefficients is zero, exactly. And that is the whole point of the lasso, is that it zeroes out these coefficients. And OK, questions or comments about this idea? So these are, I'm trying to explain these pictures they had with the diamonds that are moving around in a little more detail. Hopefully, it's enough for you guys to understand what's going on. OK, so let's, let me give you an exercise. If you can do this one, you definitely understand what's going on. And that's number three over here. So consider optimizing a purely circular mean squared error. So in the picture we were doing, the mean squared error was this funny valley. But I'm going to do an example where the mean squared error is a perfect circle. And I have a little a Desmos over here uh, where it looks like that. So the mean squared error is this, this thing over here. And imagine. For different problems, the mean squared error will be in different parts. These are the values of the mean squared error. So, so over here is a mean squared error centered around. This is some big bowl that's centered over there. But in a different problem, the true value could be over here, or it could be over here, or it could be over here. So the mean squared error could be anywhere sort of in the plane. And the question is, when is it that the lasso finds a solution on the corners? So you apply the lasso, and you're optimizing under the constraint beta 1 plus beta 2 equals 1. So you want to find, you have this mean squared function, and you want to find where on that purple diamond is it minimized. So these are the contours. Where, on, where is it minimized? And the question is, sometimes the minimum is on the corner. So for example, here, if I keep making this bigger, you'll see that the minimum happens exactly on the corner. The minimum happened on the corner. And the question is, where does that happen? Where is it true that the minimum is on the corner? Uh, so depending on where the center is, so depending on the unregularized center, so wherever you put the center, it's going to change whether or not it hits the corner first. So maybe it hits the corner first, maybe it hits the side first. And the question is, for which regions? I labeled all the regions like a clock. This is region 12, this is region 130, this is region 3, this is region 430, and so on. Which regions have the property that the lasso hits the corner first? OK. Uh, in rich regions, does beta 1, beta 2, does the lasso eliminate one of the variables? And eliminating one of the variables exactly means hitting a corner. Uh, select all the regions that apply. Is the question, does the question make sense? All right, people are nodding. I'm going to assume the question makes sense. Uh, feel free to ask me while the timer is going if the question doesn't make sense. I'll give you two or three minutes to think about this one. And again, I think you should either actually open the link or just think about what would happen in this picture Right? As you slide this thing around and try to find the minimum, in some regions, the minimum happens on the side. And in some regions, the minimum happens on the corner. Which region is which? That's the question. OK.
Okay. Who needs more time? Just like 10 seconds. Let me give, let me give another minute. I think I didn't give enough time. Okay, like 10 seconds up, put in some guesses if you haven't yet. Uh, I guess I'll only give another 30 seconds, but uh, start thinking about putting in your guesses here. Okay, let's take a look at what people said. Um, we'll just go through the regions and see which ones were popular. So you wanted to select the ones where you end on a corner. When you optimize, you end on a corner. All right, lots of different answers. Uh, the most common answer, okay, it looks like there's a pattern, right? Some of them have 14 and some of them have eight. So 12 is one of the ones where 14 people voted for it. So that's the region that is up here. And so those people, those 14 people are saying, if you start here and you increase, you keep increasing the circle, the first place you hit will be the corner. And look at that, it just works, right? The first place you hit will be the corner. You are closer to this corner, anywhere in this region, you are closer to the corner than to anywhere on the side. And so when you minimize, you find the circle that of the smallest radius that touches that purple shape, that it will be the distance between the center and here. And so you will hit the corner first, anywhere up here. Right? So, uh, so if you go over here, it still works. I, I, I guess it's very obvious if you start like here, then the first place you hit is something like that. But anywhere up here, you are closer to the exact corner than to any of these sides. So 12 o'clock is a perfectly valid answer. Let's look at a different one. Um, another one that was common was three and six and nine. And three and six and nine and 12 are all the same, just rotated, right? So if if you think it's true for 12, you should think it's true for three as well. It's exactly the same thing, right? This is over here, and now you're closer to the corner. So those ones are definitely correct. What about on these sides? On these sides over here, what happens if you start over here? Well, let's see, as you increase the thing, the first place you hit will be that line. You'll hit it somewhere in the middle right there. You don't quite hit the corner yet. And so if you're in those regions, you do not hit the corner. So the 14 people, who selected uh, 3, 6, 9, and 12, those people are right. So very good job. Uh, if you select these 130, 430, 730, and 1030 regions, in those regions, you're actually closer, where is the thing? Here it is, you're closer to the side than you are to the corner. So the distance from here perpendicular down to the side is smaller distance than from here down to the corner. And that's really what we're doing when we're doing the circle thing, we're measuring the distances. And so what does this mean? This means when you run the lasso, if the true answer is somewhere in these big regions, then you will eliminate a variable. And if the true answer is somewhere in these stripes, then you will not eliminate a variable. You will have a little bit of both variables. And then I hope you can see as you zoom out, most of the plane, right? If, if, if the answer is going to be somewhere in the universe, it's likely to be somewhere where you're going to eliminate a variable, right? The, the chances of being right in this little stripe are very low. And so as you increase the lasso parameter, as you shrink down the size of this diamond, whereas it's shrinking, making a big alpha is the same as making a really tiny circle or a tiny diamond, then you get more and more likely to eliminate variables. The bigger the alpha, the more variable, the more likely you are to eliminate variables. 
And that is the whole theory of why the lasso works. So it's this crazy thing of just changing this one small parameter. You change from a circle to a diamond. That was the first warm-up problem we did today, right? Was this, this picture. By changing from a circle to a diamond, you have this property of eliminating variables just by the geometry of being closer to the corners. Right? The circle has no corners, and so there's nothing special about this point. Um, but the diamond has corners, and that eliminates things. If you did it with a square, the same thing would work. You would have a different thing, but like a square regression would also work. I, people don't do this one because it's harder to implement. So people like the lasso, um, it's a little bit easier to implement. Uh, let's see it on a real data set. So, so far it's been all theory. In the last 10 minutes, I'll show you on a real data set. Um, but maybe before I do that, this is a good place to stop for questions. Okay, let's look at the same data set we did last time, which is the hitters data set. Right, so these were, this is exactly what we did last time. We had these people, Alan Ashby, all the way up to William, Willie Wilson, and we had their put outs, which we didn't know what it was. Last time, we made the mistake, we didn't normalize the data before we did anything. So this time, I normalized it, and now everything is on the same scale, and when things are on the same scale, it makes sense to apply the L2 norm or the L1 norm to the betas. Last time, we did uh, ridge regression, which looked like this, right? So all of the coefficients, they started out at something, and they all kind of shrink towards zero in a smooth way. It's all smooth, just smoothly going down to zero. Nothing actually ever is exactly equal to zero, right? It, it gets really close to zero, and it's just kind of like asymptotes out forever and ever. Okay, and then we did this picture of finding the best parameter by using a test set. So by testing on the test set, we found the minimum. This was all ridge regression last time. And okay, you can also do it using the ridge CV function, which is here somewhere. Uh, okay, ridge, ridge CV is somewhere. I don't know where it is. Okay, ridge, ridge, ridge. Okay, ridge CV, here's ridge CV to do it automatically with validation. Okay, nice, nice stuff. This time, same exact code, except instead of using ridge CV, I used lasso. So same, it'll run exactly the same, except you just type in lasso. I will say one other thing you need to do is you need to type in how many iterations you're going to do. Max iterations equals 10,000. How come I didn't have to do that for the ridge? Well, the ridge is a very nice function. It's got a lot to do with linear algebra. And it's because Pythagoras is the ordinary distance, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared is regular geometry. All of the regular things you do work. When you do the lasso, you're doing this nasty Manhattan distance. And the Manhattan distance, the formulas are not as nice. And so the algorithm that solves for the lasso is a lot more complicated than the algorithm that solves for the ridge. So we're making the computer sweat harder. And there's some algorithm with iterations, and if you, you need to tell it, you need to be more worried about that. So sometimes you might run it and the lasso won't converge. Like it might not work, it could break. Um, but this problem is no problem, it does work. So watch out for that, but otherwise the code is exactly the same. And here is what it looks like with the lasso. So the lasso, you start out with these uh, coefficients, and when you shrink them in, it's not a smooth petering out to zero. It doesn't smoothly go. Before, remember, it went boom, like it kind of went uh, smooth. Now, it kind of goes in, and the closer it gets to zero, it crashes into zero, and then it takes a hard right turn and goes like that. So it's a little bit hard to see. Here I tried alpha values between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the 3, so starting at 0 0.01 and ending at 1,000. Um, here's what the test set looks like. I'll talk about that in a second. But I zoomed in here, and I did it again between 10 to the minus 1 and, and 10. So you can kind of see a little bit more clearly in the middle here. This red curve, for example, starts really high, and then bam, crashes into the line, and then is exactly 0 after that. So you have these lines, where this blue one goes up and then crashes in, and then is 0. And this is exactly what we said. Like, the reason it's doing that is all the theory we did before. It's finding solutions that are exactly on the corners of that diamond. So finding solutions on the corners of the diamond are exactly these things where a bunch of the coefficients are zero. Um, and when you do that, it eliminates the variables, which is nice. So let's see, what is the best value of alpha? What is the best value of alpha? Well, you can just do cross-validation to find that out. So here I tried all the different values of alpha. I looked at the test set, and you can see the best value comes uh, somewhere between 1 and 10 in this, in this case. But kind of like, it's doing this weird thing, right? It's not smooth like it was before. It's some weird value, but again, Typical U-shaped curve, right? Over here, we're uh, overfitting. We fit everything too much. Applying some regularization helps. Now you're not overfitting as much. You have an improvement on your test error. So your training error got worse, right? We, we, we hit the 
model on the head with a bat every time it had some beta values. And so it got worse and worse on the training set, but better on the test set. This is the test set error as a typical U-shaped curve. Overfitting, the best we can do, and this is some extreme underfitting where we've turned off all the coefficients too much, and now the model is doing quite badly because it, it's really hampered. It can't do what it wants to do because we, we penalized it too much. So the perfect sweet spot is over here. And so you could rerun the model with just that value and that would be your best bet. And you can see you've improved the mean squared error from, or the root mean squared error from like 340 to 320. So like a 10% improvement, um, something like that. Um, okay, and you can do that automatically. Here's a, a zoomed in picture. Again, here's the, the minimum. There's a function called lasso CV that does the same thing with cross validation. They found a slightly different value. That's because they have a different test set, right? We had one test set with cross validation. You have a different test set that is chosen randomly, and then you're comparing it 10 times. Um, so I guess you have 10 test sets. Uh, and then this was the final thing. I ran it at the end with the final thing. So this is the last thing to say, is this is the final model. And the nice thing about this model is as you notice, many, many of the coefficients are zero, right? So when you go to apply this model in the real world, you don't even need to collect the data. Like you don't even need to know how many runs each person got, right? All you need to know the model says the only important factors are hits, years, is that years? Walks. walks, okay, hits and walks. Hits and walks, right? That's like how many times this person is going to bat and like doing actual jobs on the playing field, right? Uh, C, home runs, how many home runs? Uh, RBIs, runs batted in. Uh, put outs, we still don't know what put outs are, but apparently it's important. <laughs> uh, and division, right? Which division you're in seems to matter. But all the other ones in our model don't matter. And this is why people like the lasso is because at the end of the day, you get a simple model with fewer parameters. It's automatically doing parameter selection for you. You don't have to do that forward selection stuff like we did before. Um, and you, at the final model, we got a, a mean squared error of 325. I, I will point out the mean squared error, this is the test mean squared error, is a little bit higher than the ridge in this case. So the ridge, I think, found slightly better. What did the ridge one do? Uh, there was somewhere I did it. The ridge one, okay, well we can just look at the picture. The ridge found like 315. So in this case the ridge was a little bit better, but the lasso is a little bit easier to interpret because it has a bunch of zeros. So sometimes it's not clear which is better, right? It depends what you care about. If you really care about having coefficients that are zero, then the lasso is, is very nice. And um, that matters a lot, for example, in medical testing, because if you have a lot of things that you need to do, then you need to run more tests. Whereas if you only have like three tests you need to do, then that's better. Um, so, uh, you know, pros and cons of both. Okay, I think you guys got the picture. Um, hopefully it's all making sense. I'll stop the class there, and then I'm gonna go straight to the colloquium if you wanna come as well and learn about large language models. Uh, but otherwise, see you guys on Thursday. All right.